Welcome back. My name's Rob, and this is a course on introductory statistics for the psychological sciences. And today we're going to be going over a conceptual introduction to analysis of variance, or ANOVA. So as always, over here are the PowerPoint slides, and then up here is our virtual whiteboard. Uh, now, today, since we're really diving into the conceptual nature of ANOVA, why someone would conduct an ANOVA, the distinctions between uh, an analysis of variance test and t-tests, uh, correlations, um, we're really not going to be doing many hand calculations. So I'm going to go ahead and take the whiteboard away and we will just focus on the conceptual content of ANOVA. So as always, if you find this video helpful, don't forget to like it and subscribe to the video and click the notification bell so that you can get notifications about future videos just like this one. Okay, well let's dive in. So why would someone, what is an analysis of variance? Uh, why would someone want to conduct one of these? Well, analysis of variance, it's comparable to a t-test in the sense that um, we are essentially comparing means um, but we're, we're able to compare more than two at a time. So a t-test, you're only looking at you know, one mean versus another mean. With analysis of variance, we're able to partition variance out and compare more than two groups at a time. In addition, uh, analysis of variance allows us to examine uh, unique independent variables. So we might have different independent variables or factors that predict changes in a dependent variable. And ANOVA will allow us to measure all of those uh, at the same time. Um, now there's, just like with t-tests, we had a t-test where there was a, a one sample t-test, a t-test where there was a correlated groups or repeated measures design and we had an independent groups t-test, which was a between subjects design. There are also distinct variants based on your research design uh, with ANOVA. Um, but essentially, uh, the key thing to start out with is it allows you, if you have more than two groups, ANOVA will allow you to assess the differences between those groups uh, in, a, in a format similar to a t-test. So um, there are, as I mentioned before, a, a variety of different types of analysis of variance. You could have, um, whenever you only have one independent variable, this is called a one-way ANOVA. And that can be partitioned out again into two different types of one-way ANOVA. So if you have a between subjects measure, meaning some people are in one group and different people are in another group, and different people are in a third group, then you can compare those three between subjects uh, groups uh, in one test. Additionally, you can use a repeated measures design. So we could measure the same person three different times and see and, and compare how they change over time. There's also another type of ANOVA which uh, we'll be going into in a few lectures down the road, called a factorial ANOVA. So a factorial ANOVA is whenever you have more than one independent variable. So, for example, we might have, uh, you know, measure, measure people, give them some kind of treatment uh, in one variable, and then look at the differences between males and females in another variable. And through this design, we're able to see how um, not only does our treatment affect the dependent variable and uh, biological sex affect the dependent variable, but how those two variables interact with each other or how the effect of treatment might depend on biological sex. Um, so we can, we, we're able to tease out not just these what are called main effects of each independent variable, but also how they interact and in their influence on the dependent variable. So in a similar way, a factorial ANOVA uh, is also 
separated by the type of research design. So there's three predominant types. There's a between subjects factorial ANOVA, and that would be if you had two independent variables that were between subjects. And so the example I just used where we have some kind of treatment type, right? Presumably you're giving different people, you know, one, one group of people a some type type of psychological treatment and other the other group is a control condition. And then if we have biological sex as the second variable, both of those are between subjects factors, right? And so that is a between subjects factorial ANOVA. However, we could also have two repeated measures variables, right? Where we're measuring people on multiple variables over time. So we could do pre post and, uh, you know, have, a, have another factor, uh, like we, we might measure, if we were doing EEG, we could measure two different electrodes that were measured within the same person um, at the same time, but they're repeated measures because they occur within the person. So that would be an example of a repeated measures factorial ANOVA. And then a mixed factorial ANOVA is whenever you have some kind of combination of between subjects and repeated measures independent variables. Okay. So ANOVA, in sum, is a family of different tests that vary based on the number of independent variables you're analyzing as well as the design, uh, the research design, whether it's a between subjects, within subjects, or mixed design. So one important distinction, um, and, and if not understood, a, a very big source of confusion, would be distinguishing between an independent variable or a factor, in ANOVA speak, uh, versus the level of a independent variable or a factor. So let's use, uh, let's continue our example from before. Say we have some kind of treatment, right? We're, and, and here we're giving one group of people Tofranil, which is a, a antidepressant. We're giving another group of people Prozac. And then we're giving a third group of people some kind of placebo. Now, Tofranil, Prozac, and placebo are the levels of a higher order factor or independent variable called treatment type. So we can say that treatment type has three levels. So it's important not to confuse a factor with the levels of the factor. It's very easy to uh, think that Tofranil, Prozac, and placebo are independent variables, three separate independent variables, when in fact they're just one independent variable under the heading of treatment type. So a one-way between subjects ANOVA only has one factor, but that one factor or independent variable can have many different levels. So for example, in a one-way design, which by definition has one factor or one independent variable, you can see here we've got three different groups. However, in a factorial ANOVA, we can have more than one factor. So if we wanted to look at the effects of these three different treatment conditions or treatment types across biological sex, we would have uh, a two by three factorial design. And we get the two because there's two levels of biological sex. And we get the three because there are three levels to the treatment type variable. And interestingly, if you multiply two by three, you can you get six, right? And you can see in this figure that there are six different cells. So there's going to be females who get Tofranil and males who get Tofranil. Females who get Prozac, males who get Prozac. Females who get placebo and males who get placebo. So this type of factorial design allows us to not just look at the effect of treatment type or the effect of biological sex, but also how type of treatment depends on a person's biological sex. Okay, so uh, you can see here, you know, we're getting the two by three, right? 
the three level factor is the three, the two level factor is the two. And you could, it would be just as correct to say this is a three by two factorial design. So it really doesn't matter the order. What, what the key is here is that you understand that when labeling a factorial design, um, the numbers in front of it are representative of how many levels the factors in that design have. Okay, so here's another example. So what, what would this be? What type of design, uh, factorial design, would you get from a setup like this? So here we are giving people Toffernell, Prozac, MDMA, and placebo. And we're comparing veterans and non-veterans. So veterans versus non-veterans, that's going to be a two because there's two levels. And then treatment type is going to be four. So this is a two by four factorial ANOVA. So in addition, so let's go back to, to what we were uh, discussing before when we were doing t-tests. Consistently, I believe in every presentation, we saw this idea that we're all we're really doing is looking at mean difference over error. That's no difference in an, that's no different in ANOVA. We're essentially doing the same thing. So keep in mind that in when we say error, this is a measure of sampling error. Uh, it's an estimate of the population standard deviation that's adjusted for our sample size. And the larger our sample is, the more it reduces our error. And the reason is because the more bigger our sample is, the closer our sample estimate of the population will be to the actual population. And we have more confidence in that estimate. And so we make it easier on ourselves. Um, whereas if we had a smaller sample with less statistical power, we would, enter, we would add more error to our estimate. So the key here that I want to point out is that what we were using to estimate error was our standard deviation. Now, saying that um, we're looking at mean difference over error is really not any different from saying um, that we're looking at the effect of the independent variable over a measure of error, and in this case, units of standard deviation for a t-test. However, what is standard deviation? It's just simply the square root of the variance. So if we square our standard deviation, then we're in variance territory. And what ANOVA is looking at is it's looking at the variance explained by our independent variable, which is essentially the effect of the independent variable, over the variance unexplained, those things that cause change in our dependent variable that we're not explaining through our independent variable. And so, this is uh, essentially the same concept as looking at a mean difference over error, except now we're looking at it in units of variance. So again, um, basically the standard deviation squared is the variance. What we're doing in ANOVA is we're simply shifting things looking at it in units of variance and partialing variance out into variance that's explained and variance unexplained. And that ratio between variance explained and variance unexplained is going to be like the equivalent of a T in analysis of variance, but we call it an F. And in fact, um, if this is confusing, just disregard it, but in fact, a T squared equals F. Right, so if you square a t-value, it will give you the uh, the uh, identical um, result that you would get for an f-value using two groups. Okay, so another way to kind of look at variance, because what we're doing is we're this whole ANOVA process is just partialing variance out into different buckets, right? So we need to start out with the understanding that the total variance in our dependent variable is going to be comprised of uh, variance explained by the independent variable 
and the remaining variance that is left unexplained by our independent variable, the things we don't know, right? And so in, in ANOVA language, an independent variable for a between subjects ANOVA is going to be the variance, variance explained between the different levels of the IV. The error is going to be the variance that's left unexplained within the, the groups of our IV. So here's a question. If T tests and ANOVAs are so simple, or so similar, why don't we just do several T tests, right? And this is a, a, a great question, right? So we could just compare group one to group two, group two to group three, and then group one to group three, and we would essentially be doing the same as an ANOVA with a t-test. But there is one issue with this, and that's that uh, the family-wise error rate of those tests, meaning all of the, the, if we take the error of those tests, of each test, and look at our, the likelihood that we will be committing a type one error, in other words, saying there's an effect when there really isn't one, it'll be inflated by the number of tests. So going back to probability, when we have this, this and that, right, we multiply them together. Well, essentially to compute the family wise error rate, you're essentially cubing the error rate of each individual test if you had three tests, 0.05 times 0.05 times 0.05. More formal way to do it is first to convert it into um, the inverse of the type one error rate and then convert it back. So we can see here that if we were conducting three t-tests uh, to compare all these groups, our family-wise error rate would no longer be 0.05, it would be 0.1426. And that means that we would have basically a 14.3% chance of saying that there's a significant effect when there really isn't one. And so we want to be a little more precise and keep our family-wise error rate at 5%. So another reason is, look at what would happen if you had five groups, for example. I mean, how many t-tests would you have to conduct to assess every, every one of those comparis group comparisons? You'd have to look at group one versus group two, group one versus group three, group one versus group four, group one versus group five, group two versus group three, and on and on and on. Um, and so that would be quite tedious to um, have to run all of these different tests um, when you can just do it and control for your family-wise error rate using ANOVA. So if we had five groups, our family-wise error rate would increase even more. And there would be a 23% chance that we would be committing a type one error if we were just doing t-tests to compare five different groups. Um, ANOVA is gonna keep our family-wise error rate at our desired level of 0.05. So for the next part, I'm gonna just walk through uh, the different steps that we would do to conduct a one-way ANOVA. And uh, for each step, we'll, we'll kind of go through uh, the similarities and differences that an ANOVA has with a t-test, and uh, we'll just talk about each step conceptually. We're gonna get to 0.6, right? We're gonna get to um, what, how we determine whether to reject or fail, reject, fail to reject the null hypothesis. And then in the next lecture, in lecture 17.2, we're gonna go into subtests, call, often called post hoc tests or planned comparisons that we'll use um, to tease apart differences between groups uh, in a more precise way. And we'll do the APA style write-up. In the third lecture, we're going to do a full computational example of a one-way note.